friends uh, it is rather uh, difficult to follow after uh, george's grand eloquence in the reminiscences just as it was rather difficult to follow him as a director <laughs> but now i will try uh, i jot down a few points here rather than uh, speak extempore because i wanted to cover a few things <coughs> It's a pleasure for me to be a part of this Golden Jubilee Symposium of the uh, Golden Jubilee of the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Fifty years is indeed not uh, uh, very long. It's a halfway mark of a century, believed to be of significance in some spheres, such as cricket scores or human longevity. But uh, educational institutions like universities tend to be rather have work on a longer time frames i refer to uh, institute of mathematical sciences as a university because i understand it is now a deemed to be university as a part of the the homi baba university which uh, da has created famous universities like bologna sorbonne oxford are all more than centuries old eight centuries old and uh, our own takshashila and uh, nalanda probably had a long lasting presence before their end came i do not know why in comparison we are just infants and as infants we can uh, be excused for a few fables here and there but nevertheless we will grow firmly into a long lasting university carrying great traditions of scholarship it has already established during this first 50 years i recall my first encounter with the institute when i took part in a symposium during the winter of 1967 <coughs> this is obviously later than the uh, the theoretical seminar circuit but which we'll hear more but the institute was already on and the main building was down then the downstairs room was where the we met and i think um, a few others in this hall also were there like uh, divakaran and uh, balachandran and rashikaran etc were there at that symposium subsequently i have had uh, been i have been in professional contact with Institute of Mathematical Sciences while I was at IIT Kanpur and in 1987 December we had organized a workshop at IIT Kanpur on the emerging then emerging super string theory jointly organized and I, with active participation by Institute of Mathematical Sciences and Tata Institute so these are the earlier uh, contacts that i had with math science and in particular i remember uh, the great enthusiasm with which participation from uh, institute of mathematical sciences contributed to that super string initiative which in fact has grown sufficiently noticeably in the world around it is a couple of years later that i received the offer to join as a director of this august institution i'm again i'm actually in most fortunate in having been at iit kanpur during the 70s and 80s when it emerged as a leading center of pedagogy in the modern context the most important aspect of iit came i believe was the primacy it gave to the young faculty in the shaping the destiny of the institute it had imported an ac academic framework prevalent then at institutions such as MIT Carnegie Mellon Caltech US University of California Berkeley etc and we were engaged in adapting it to our needs there is very little hierarchy and invariably scholarship was highly respected the director the deans and the heads of departments and in particular the founding director P.K. Kelker gave the faculty an atmosphere 
of freedom in which they can indulge fully to realize their dreams uh, so much so that every one of the them felt that the development of iit rests on his or her shoulders squarely and on their it is their personal responsibility with this historical baggage i took charge as the director of the institute with some trepidation i was again fortunate that the foundation that this august institution was laid by my illustrious predecessors professor alladi ramakrishnan who saw it in the vision in his vision as a indian version of the institute of advanced study at princeton many distinguished scientists such as niels bohr richard dalitz abdul salam mari gelman hans bethe and chandrashekar had visited and lectured here and very soon we will hear from professor krishna krishna those glorious beginnings together with the visuals of the institute then in 1984 george sudarshan and g rashikaran led the institute and enabled appropriate phase transition by the time i came on the scene in july 1990 Quite a few of your youngsters had already joined, and the institute was poised to grow both numerically and in qualitatively. With an enthusiastic young brigade of physicists, mathematicians, and computer scientists, not very different from what I was used to at IIT Kanpur in my early career, my task was rather simple: merely to make sure that the atmosphere in the institute. is such that their dreams are realized as much as possible and i am proud to be associated with a fine band of people with a keen sense of responsibility and admirably positive attitude to active strive and cement the best traditions of scholarship combined with a commitment as it was often referred to earlier to outreach outside at iis at the institute of mathematics sciences there were about 25 in the faculty when i took charge with about 10 among them due to retire in about a decade in that during the decade ahead when i passed on the baton later to balu i think there were on the rolls about 45 and he mentioned that now it's almost close to 60 and uh, i remember the word 60 because uh, i was once asked by one of the de uh, joint secretaries whether we have got appropriate sanction for adding new faculty and uh, uh, fortunately george had done that uh, in a, one of the earlier board meetings and he had got a, an approval for adding 60 faculty plus one director and uh, having now done that also he had done a very important additional uh, uh, statement made that these 60 positions will not be filled immediately but will be filled only when appropriate persons are available are available with the result i should uh, i was able to in fact make use of that statement which was recorded ceremoniously by the board that i was always sanctioned to have up to 60 So, if uh, Balu says that he has reached sixty, he has to go back to uh, his board to find out how the sixty can be crossed. In the nineties, I remember it became clear that the biology and life sciences were strongly influencing physics, and turning both analytical and mathematical. in the process it was on these thoughts that professor baskaran and uh, professor anishetty in fact started a forum to explore the interface between bas- biology and physics i notice now several of our condensed matter physics and statistical physics 
are engaged in problems that originate in life sciences. Perhaps it is time to usher in dedicated life sciences, particularly theory, inducted at IMSE. Probably it should be possible to breach the barrier of 60 and allow more disciplines to be added and more institute meets the current needs. I proudly reminisce the many outreach programs that used to touch base with both colleges as well as students that were initiated here. IMSC has been a venue for regular programs such as mathematical training schemes and workshops and the movie that we saw earlier clearly says the commitment of people here for enthusiastic participation by students even pursuing other courses elsewhere to benefit from a mathematics rigorous mathematical training. We have played host to and originators of collaborative and learning and research. Briefly, both the infrastructure of the institute as well as the human resources have been fully made available to everyone. And this is again uh, emphasized in the movie that we just saw. At the time I joined IMSC, we were on the threshold of digital revolution. I think uh, as George mentioned about it. Computers on the one hand intruded seriously on the com scientific communication on the one hand and scientific computation, computations transformed from their early phase of process of analytic expressions only and into a, 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 a unique paradigm. Earlier it was only a, 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 a numerical process of analytical expressions and equations, but today it has graduated to something much more. The institute had a head start on this thanks to the initiative, initial efforts of Professor K. Srinivasrao that uh, George mentioned and also Professor Hindi Haridas. Later, the institute became computer savvy with at least an exterm on everyone's desk. I had the benefit of uh, Rahul Basu, T. Jairaman, and several others, Kapil Paranjpe, to ensure that this institute is uh, uh, has a primal position as far as the utility of computers as a software. We went on to construct experimental cluster. If I recall, it was the effect of S. Kamakoti, one of our postdocs, which was followed by Haridas State of Art 128 node cluster Kabru. And I understand we keep the lead in the scientific computing with Aravalli and Annapurna. And therefore, we are always on the lead as far as the facilities for research here is concerned. I have also enjoyed the support of our principal provide fund providers with a very active encouragement of all DAE chairmen, such as Dr. Ajaramana and uh, M.R. Srinivasan before I came on scene, and uh, Dr. P.K. Ayengar and Chidambaram during my lifetime. Chidambaram's refrain was a plea that IMSC faculty lend 20% of their time devoting to GAE's core program as well as enrich them. I do believe that uh, IMSC has always felt that it is the responsibility to enrich the activities of uh, uh, DAE in all uh, and, similar, and uh, uh, conversely uh, DAE has a mandate to uh, support theoretical sciences in a big way. With all these present thoughts, I look forward to continuing pursuit of science as the way of life, as ind indicated in the frontispiece of the entrance of the main building. Let me wish a glorious second half of 50 years for MSC, IMSC. Chandran, I now invite Dr. C.V.S. Venkatraman to say a few words.
thank uh, Professor Balasubramaniam for giving me this opportunity uh, to be present amongst your midst on this happy occasion. Uh, let me also take the opportunity to wish all the dignitaries on the dais and all of you a very happy new year. <coughs> uh, as far as mathematics is concerned, I could consider myself as a completely layman. I stopped studying mathematics at high school level. Generally, I felt that uh, mathematics evokes three uh, feelings. It could be uh, fear, it could be respect and it could be love. And I am sure all of you are here because you love mathematics. People who love mathematics are mathematicians or physicists or whatever. <coughs> people who respect mathematics and fear mathematics are people like me who manage to uh, come out unscathed. <coughs> From mathematics. Though I should say uh, it was a little bit unfortunate because uh, our mathematics teacher, uh, he was a good man. Uh, during the class, he would uh, write out the explanation or the equation on the board. And then, if we make a note of it, he will scold us. You have to note that also, you do not understand such simple things. Then next moment if you are not noting, he will again scold, why are you staring at me, note it down. So we had a great confusion as to what thing is to be noted and what thing is not to be noted. Anyway, the one point which is uh, I think universally agreed, I make bold to make this statement, uh, is uh, the waning love amongst uh, students in general for uh, core subjects like mathematics and physics, mathematics in particular. Uh, I had the opportunity to do my doctoral study in public health uh, from uh, a U.S. university, University of Illinois at Chicago, and as a part of doctor of uh, doctoral program, one has to study research methods which has statistics. And uh, I had to, I enjoyed. I should confess that uh, uh, I enjoyed uh, completing the uh, statistics course. Uh, I had to take uh, tuition from a Chinese student. And after uh, the Chinese student explained to me, I felt uh, it is not all that difficult and all these years I have been afraid. And speaking to faculty members in the US also, I came with a view, came back with a view that uh, all over the world there is a uh, feeling and there is a fear that uh, young students are not uh, taking to mathematics in large numbers. Uh, this could be because unlike most other subjects uh, which have applications uh, down in the society like industrial applications, uh, subjects are used in uh, areas of enterprise which yield good income, mathematics by itself uh, does not have applications which yield good income. Maybe that is the reason and personally this is my feeling, it would be an excellent idea, I think we should, uh, we in the department including myself should work towards the idea of the government of India supporting mathematics uh, across the country, uh, I mean in addition to uh, institutes of excellence like this. In all the universities, if not all uh, select universities, a large number of them, the departments of mathematics in terms of uh, supporting the faculty, supporting their salaries. Library, building good libraries, uh, research facilities, conference facilities, etc. And scholarships for students who join uh, mathematics stream right from I would say undergrad uh, studies uh, through post graduation and doctoral studies. Uh, we would definitely like to work on that idea. Uh, then coming to this institute, I have had the 
uh, good uh, fortune of being associated for the past about eight or nine months as uh, a member of the Board of uh, Governors. And uh, we have some issues uh, relating to this institute, uh, particularly land for expansion. We are working on that and we are hopeful that we will get uh, uh, the bit of government land which is adjacent to the institute. Uh, the Chief Secretary to Government of Tamil Nadu was kind enough to uh, offer to us the land at the same rate at which it was offered in 2003. Uh, so we hope it will come through. And while going through the notes, I uh, saw that uh, there is also a problem relating to roads and drains. Uh, we will see if uh, we can take them up. There is a concept in Government of India of uh, even institutes uh, like this, which are not, uh, say for example, uh, uh, income earning bodies, undertaking activities uh, under a head which is called neighborhood development. So maybe we can make a proposal, get the approval of the competent authority in the department and uh, write to Government of Tamil Nadu, offer to them saying that we'll uh, build this road and we'll build this drain, please permit us so that we can build uh, good roads and uh, bridges in an idiomatic sense. Uh, thank you very much. I wish the institute all the best. Thank you, Dr. Venkaraman. I now invite the chief guest, Professor Emma Srinivasan, to address the gathering. Good morning to all of you, and uh, wish you a happy new year. Professor George Sudarshan, Professor Ramchandran, Professor Balsubramaniam, Dr. Vangitramna, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here this morning at the invitation that uh, Dr. Balsubramaniam extended to me to be part of this uh, Golden Jubilee celebration of this institute. Uh, I remember my association for about three years when I was uh, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission when George was the director. And I also remember that in those days, we required some monies for uh, uh, the library block. I think that was uh, one of the early uh, construction activities that George wanted to give high priority to, and then extensions to the administration block and so forth. So George and I worked closely together to, in, to, to improve the infrastructure that existed then. And uh, of course, I now see that uh, tomorrow you're going to um, initiate the expansion of the library and other such facilities. Well, the Department of Atomic Energy uh, has been supporting activities in the field of mathematics, as you know. And I remember when I was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, there was a meeting of the Indian Mathematical Congress in somewhere in Pune or the other. And they came down very heavily on why the Department of Atomic Energy should uh, take over the support of mathematics. What they misunderstood was that when Dr. Baba was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, he had said support for higher mathematics would also be a part of the Atomic Energy's mandate. He didn't say that other people shouldn't support it. All he said was that the Department of Atomic Energy would also support mathematics. And therefore, we started funding under this National Board of Higher Mathematics. In the earlier days, it was uh, Professor Narsimhan who was the chair of that committee, and later it was Raghunathan. So when Raghunathan was the chair and this, was this, this particular Congress was held, they said, take away this mathematics from the Atomic Energy Department and put it somewhere else. So then, at that time, and even as now, CNR Rao was the chairman of the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Prime Minister, and he said, Dr. Srinivasan, they have passed a very bad resolution Will you kindly come and meet us and explain what your positions? I said, look, Atomic Energy is supporting mathematics because he thinks it is in its interest to do so. And we haven't said other people shouldn't support it. I said, we would welcome all other people who want to support mathematics to do so. And I don't know really if other institutions have similarly gone out. Of course, something has happened. Defense science has put money. So has space and so forth. But no, mathematics is such a fundamental building block of society. I'm not, of course, no talking uh, uh, in uh, simple terms of applications only, but both the fundamentals, that is the basic mathematics, or the pure mathematics, as one would like to call it, and applied mathematics have both contributed so much uh, to the growth of civilization as we know, that it uh, is evident that any civilized society should spend a lot of its uh, intellectual capital on the pursuit 
of uh, uh, this tradition. Now, of course, uh, the activities of this institute have been guided by some outstanding people. Of course, we had uh, Alari Ramakrishna, who really started the idea of this institution, and I think uh, built it up at great personal commitment of his time, of his family assets, and so forth. And so he steered the institute through this early uh, period of growth, because they did get support from the government of Tamil Nadu, especially Minister Subramaniam was extremely supportive at all times of this institution. But the bigger growth took place after the Department of Atomic Energy stepped in uh, to, 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 to take up the funding of this institute. And that was the period of George's tenure as director and subsequently of Ramachandran. And of course, I now see that Dr. Bal Subramaniam is now taking it into, uh, uh, into higher growth mode as we must. Now, of course, uh, uh, I noted that uh, Ramachandran mentioned that uh, I, have not, I can't remember whether he mentioned 20% or 30% of the math science activities as uh, contributing or being relevant to the core programs of the Department of Atomic Energy. Well, there are many areas in the activities of the Department of Atomic Energy where mathematics should play a much bigger role. For example, there is all this debate on nuclear reactor safety, probabilistic safety analysis, tsunami. I heard the word tsunami and glacier activities as one of Balu's uh, agenda items. Well, all, these are all areas of great relevance. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, an understanding of natural occurrences, whether tsunami periodicity is 1,000 years or 10,000 years or whatever. And uh, hindcasting and forecasting of these things is extremely important. Now, this leads me, uh, because of course uh, I'm in the last one year, uh, involved a great deal uh, in the issues of public understanding of risks and so forth of nuclear energy. I'd like to make a few comments on what I've seen in recent newspaper articles. Yesterday, in the Hindu and some of the other articles, there's a big uh, report about this protest in Kodankulam. And as you all know, some of you may know, that there are two reactors of 1,000 megawatts uh, which are being built there. These are the first large size reactors that we are building. In fact, the first unit one would be the first 1,000 megawatt unit to go into service. We have 20 reactors operating, but our largest pre presence is about 540 megawatts. Now, this reactor, which should have gone into operation last year, has been stalled for a long time. Of course, now probably it will start up next week or so, uh, the next 10 days. But we have had an enormous amount of public misunderstanding about uh, the safety of this reactor. And in yesterday's newspaper coverage, the person who has been leading the agitation, his name is Uday Kumar, has been depicted as a national hero. Now, this man is a political scientist, and clearly he doesn't have any understanding of nuclear safety. It is true that the accident in Japan has created a great deal of public scare and uh, has created uh, fear, genuine fear in the minds of people who live around all nuclear installations. But then to suggest, for example, that uh, an earthquake of intensity of 9 on the Richter scale or a tsunami of 15 meters can hit any of our course is completely unrealistic. It is rather like saying, have you proved the safety of installations in Madras uh, for a huge uh, uh, snow blizzard, because in recorded history, I haven't had snow in this part of the world at all. Or like somebody is asking, well, what's going to happen if there is a coronal mass ejection from the, from, the, from, from the sun? Well, of course, yeah, we know that some transformers can get knocked out. There could be some lightning protectors knocked out, etc. But uh, the world survives. But you see, these are the kinds of questions uh, that, that keep uh, being asked by lay people who, of course, uh, have an agenda. But uh, we have got, then got many people who tend to believe it. For example, there is a former chief of our naval staff who would like to be advised by political scientists about reactor safety than by professional people. He says in public that nobody has explained the safety of these reactors to the people. When this agitation was going on, there was a 15-man committee which was headed by uh, Professor Muthunayakam, uh, the former uh, Secretary of the Department of Ocean Development, who after being many years in the space uh, activity, uh, spent quite a bit of his time in uh, understanding of uh, ocean problems, tsunami, and so forth. He, along with many other people, 
they produce extensive documentation on all the issues raised by these agitators. But then this former chief of the naval staff says no answers have been given. In other words, they don't take notice of the information that's put out because nobody wants to take the trouble of reading um, you know, serious scientific documentation and trying to understand the pros and cons. Then recently in Madras, we had a historian of distinction who lives in Bangalore. His name is Ramchandra Guha, who probably many of you may have read his books. Uh, he made a, ta a speech in uh, IIT Madras, and he said, oh, well, you know, India should follow the Chinese model of uh, emphasis on renewable energy. The Chinese are supposed to be doing a lot of work on solar and wind. Certainly, yes, we must uh, take the example of China in solar and wind. But what he forgot to mention, and what the public is not informed is, the Chinese have a very, very large nuclear reactor construction program right now. So is one part which is not, it's, he's not telling a lie, it's only a partial truth. Right now, China is building 26 1,000 megawatt reactors. They had called a halt for a few months last year after the uh, Japanese accident. And then they also carried out the survey, the safety reviews, and they said, yes, we're going to move ahead. What uh, Ramchandra Guha didn't say was, the Chinese have built enormous amount of coal-fired power stations, and they're building nuclear power stations, and they're also building solar and wind uh, power stations. So this kind of thing goes on. And why I'm trying to take a little time of your time is, I've been addressing similar scientist groups uh, in Bombay at the TAFR, in BARC, in Calcutta, the SA Institute, and elsewhere. What I'm finding is that in India now, many of our scientists who understand science seem to be completely indifferent to getting involved into understanding these issues and analyzing them and trying to contribute to some degree of rational opinion building. Of course, I must say that there's one scientist, I don't know if he's here today, of uh, math science, who has chosen uh, to take uh, this debate in the public domain. I think he has been writing some articles in, uh, in the Hindu, and I appreciate that very much. But I don't see why more of our people who ought to be able to understand the pros and cons better would like to get involved in this kind of uh, applications of science and technology for society's benefit. Of course, it's true that uh, uh, unlike in the past, when one accepted everything that uh, uh, new science brings in is necessarily good, now we've got to be careful because we know much better about the adverse impact, uh, for example, of carbon dioxide on, on the climate or of the excessive use of antibiotics for uh, treatment of uh, uh, various types of illness and so forth. So we, we, we now know much more than we did in the past that uh, a, a new development doesn't necessarily bring with it um, only good, but there can also be an adverse impact. But the issue that I am now wishing to share with my friends in, uh, in the audience here is that in India, we are not finding that our intellectual pe uh, people who are intellectually well informed are prepared to get into the domain of policy making. We seem to still think that somebody else must do the policy making. We have still got a colonial mindset. Of course, in the British days, when they were ruling, they didn't want any of the Indians to get involved with the formulation of uh, policies. They said it was their prerogative. Later on, some of the Indians were co-opted with them. The ICS or four of the other people that were involved with them, they were carried and, and made part of the decision-making process. But now, all of us should be getting involved. For instance, on issues of energy independence or energy security, every one of you must have uh, a view. You are having power cut in the rest of Tamil Nadu 10, 14 hours of the day. How can industry survive? How can any kind of business or commercial activity be viable? The, all these factories in Coimbatore, in um, uh, Trichy area, everything is shut down. Uh, how can the economy progress at, I don't know, some people, our prime minister keeps on talking about 8%, 9%. You see, he seems to talk a great deal only when the economic growth percentages come. And he's only talking about these percentages. All these percentages will be unviable if you don't have the basic infrastructure of power, of roads, of communication, of water, of cement, of steel, and so forth. Now, there's a big nostalgia in this country. We tend to think, oh, well, 150 or 100 years ago, life was simple. I want to tell you that when I grew up as a, little, as a young fellow in one a small town in Mysore, in, then it was Mysore State, now it's part of Karnataka, we didn't have electricity in the home. We had no pipe water supply. So we used to have uh, kerosene hurricane lamps, and we used to go and get water from a spring some distance away. So that was the way things were. But now, 
it's a completely different situation. You can't hark back and go back to those days when you could use firewood for cooking. There's no more firewood available. And the population of this country has gone up so much, now 1.2 billion. How can you supply basic necessities to this large population unless you are able to uh, organize yourself uh, in a massive manner in terms of agricultural production, in terms of steel, cement, in terms of road building and so forth. For instance, some people say, the, the, the former naval chief said, we have got so much solar energy, why do we need any other form of energy? Well, he doesn't realize, first of all, that today solar energy will cost minimum two or probably actually four times as much as energy from coal, gas, or, uh, or nuclear. So at that, then can you also run railway systems? Can you run steel plants? Can you run large manufacturing units on solar energy? Because we're only having solar energy for some eight hours of the day, and the rest of the time we won't have solar energy. And if you have to have the storage capacity, you're going to have investments for that purpose, or wind available 20, 35 percent of the time. So all these kinds of issues are raised in a totally unscientific manner. Uh, and then the media and the general public seems to be so happy when we stop a steel plant, when we stop an aluminum plant, when we stop a road, when we stop a railway line. We are so happy. And then, you know, all of us enjoy watching on this electronic media the, way the various people hounding out those fellows who are trying to build the projects and saying, well, look, you are anti-national, you are anti-social. All of us who are involved in all these nation-building activities, we are not criminals. We love the country as much as these protesters. Now, but then there is a syndrome in this country that if you stop something, you've actually done a great a good to the society. Recently, or not recently, some six or eight months ago, one uh, correspondent by name Harish Khare, he writes quite often from time to time in the Hindu, he said that in India now, we romanticize agitation and celebrate chaos. Now, he has put it very well. Everywhere we are having chaos, but we don't organize ourselves. Then, of course, there are some people who say, oh, small is beautiful. Why do you require these huge, big power stations? Let's go back to, maybe if it is possible, to a decentralized generation on solar or wind. But then, unless you have large systems, you cannot tackle this large population. For instance, Chennai or Bombay or other places, unless you put in so much of energy, you bring in people to work and take them out, you can't keep the city going. So large systems require large organization. You really cannot go back to those old uh, uh, simple systems that might have been there long, long time ago. So now, the only other society in the world which has managed to take up the challenge of large population is China. Look at the way they are progressing. They have managed to find a way. I'm not now defending China on human rights or the lack of democracy or such other issues. I'm only trying to suggest that they have managed to transform a society that was as poor as India was in 1950. Now they are counted among the middle income countries. How have they done that? It's because they have been able to see their way clearly. It's not this nebulous, uh, you know, everybody trying to stall things uh, that is the mode, but everybody putting their heads together to find a way to, to proceed. Now what I would like institutions such as yours is to get involved in, uh, um, in societal issues of science and technology also. Yes, it's good start you have made if you're going to study tsunami, um, and then, then uh, uh, <coughs> glaciers and so forth. But I think you must all become centers of advice, of balanced advice on various types of issues. Uh, and, and we cannot stand as only bystanders, because we're all part of society. For this society to move, we must get involved in all our uh, national debates, national activities, and so forth. Of course, I'm not suggesting that you should all become politicians or anything, but where objective advice is to be given, I mean, I mentioned about reactor safety. I'm not suggesting you go immediately into that field, but some intellectual groups such as yours should get into that so that there's another expertise available who can give uh, bi uh, unbiased advice. Now, going back to this Japanese system, uh, the Japanese uh, disaster, I'd like to tell you that the Japanese Parliamentary Commission has found that apart from this very serious, unfortunate, natural uh, calamity of a very serious earthquake and tsunami, that there were things that the Japanese uh, power station authorities could have done that they didn't do. For instance, they, could not, they did not anticipate 
uh, that tsunami of a higher level than they had initially designed for was possible. Whereas some Japanese scientists advised them in 2002, the previous history indicated that much higher tsunamis was possible. They could quite easily have put additional emergency power supply at a much higher level, and the cost in all would not have been uh, forbidding. But so such a simple lapse on their part gave rise to such a serious accident. Now to go back to this question of accidents, you know when the jet aircraft were introduced for civilian travel, there were a series of crashes of this comet aircraft. I think many of you would have remembered. If you are in the age group of about 60 or 70, you would have known a series of aircrafts crashed. But people didn't give up on uh, jet aircraft. They found out what the problem was. There was a problem called metal fatigue. And then they found out a way of designing the aircraft to withstand uh, the material properties and uh, not suffer from fatigue. And then successful aircraft have been built. Similarly, after the Bhopal gas tragedy, the world has not stopped chemical plants being built. They only made them safer. So it's the same thing with uh, nuclear energy also. Now, this uh, former naval chief, he said the whole world is giving up nuclear energy. It's not true. There are 430 reactors working today, and 60 or 70 are being built. So again, you know, we don't now stop to analyze these facts, but people will just believe what's been said in some, uh, you know, uh, excited uh, uh, public uh, uh, fora. And then uh, spread uh, uh, disinformation. So I think the biggest problem to India's uh, progress now is not so much absence of uh, scientific knowledge, uh, not so much absence of competence, as the unwillingness on our part to sit calmly and put our heads together and then agree upon a path forward. Of course, now that is not immediately relevant to the uh, Match Sciences Golden Jubilee. But what I'd like to say is that although you have grown well in the last 50 years, you must plan for a much, much bigger rate of growth. Because, of course, the good old uh, statement, you know, when, when, when Pandit Nehru was the uh, prime minister, he was always talking about the scientific temper. My, my fear is that although the scientific temper has grown in some way, there's actually an anti-scientific temper that's growing in our society. And I think that is something that we should be trying to fight against. And I think the outreach programs that you have must be uh, uh, strengthen. You got to. You got to have a presence everywhere. Uh, if sitting in Chennai, you must cover all the districts. You have uh, outreach uh, activities. Encourage more people to go into mathematics, into into physics, into other sciences, and also sensitize them to work for the larger good of society. So I wish this institute a glorious next 50 years. Thank you very much. The permanent exhibition on uh, the activities of the institute, which was described by Indira Chaudhary of Srishti earlier, is located in the adjoining corridor. It is currently covered by a curtain, which will be drawn back to reveal the exhibition panels when our chief guest presses the button on the dais. Following this, there will be a vote of thanks, after which the exhibition will be opened for viewing. I now request our chief guest, Professor Srinivasan, to open the permanent exhibition. Respected guests, distinguished delegates, invitees, and members of the institute. Very happy new year to you all. I am honored to be here to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the governing board, executive council, and the director IMSC, and the organizing committee members of this institute, Golden Jubilee celebrations of this institute. And on my own behalf, I have great honor and privilege 
to extend our heartfelt gratitude and thanks to Dr. M. R. Srinivasan, Professor E. C. G. Sudarshan, Professor R. Ramachandran, Dr. C. B. S. Venkatramana for sparing their invaluable time to be with us this morning. Sirs, your august presence among us is in recognition of the achievements of the institute, in particular its contributions to research in mathematical services, teaching and outreach programs in the educational sector. Thank you, sirs. We are thankful to the Higher Education Department, Government of Tamil Nadu, who have been very generous in providing us invaluable infrastructure support to the institute since its inception in 1962. We are also thankful to the Department of Atomic Energy, Government of India, for their generosity in extending continuous financial grants, technical support, administrative and infrastructural support since 1984 in recognition of the value of the institute as the source of intellectual manpower needed for the society. The continuous support of these two governments is invaluable for us. It lets do our best in what we are trained for and not divert our energies elsewhere. Thank you, sirs. I am sure that today, 50 years after founding the institute, the vision and goals of the founders stands fulfilled. I thank the family members of Professor Aladi Ramakrishnan for being with us today and providing us many documents, photographs that went into the preparation of the commemorative booklet and the permanent exhibition. Thank you, sirs. Thank you, madam. Thanks to all of them for their sincerity about conception of this institute. We are indeed grateful to the distinguished delegates, invites, officers from various organizations, media personnel for their august presence in this uh, historic occasion. We wish to express our sincere gratitude and deep thanks to the staff members of the institute, postdoctoral fellows, research scholars, visitors for their presence here. We are thankful to all those external members, especially Dr. Indira Choudhury and her team for, from Srishti for timely arrangement of archival exhibition, publication of commemorative booklet and recording video on the activities of the institute. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to all speakers for gracing the occasion and delivering inspiring and kind words. Events like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels started rolling months ago. It requires planning and birds you a bird's eye for details. The institute is fortunate enough to be backed by a strong and dedicated organizing committee of the Golden Jubilee Con Conference, Professor Ramanujam, Professor Murthy, Professor Date, Professor Krishna Madali, Professor Meena Mahajan and the director IMSC for guiding various teams with great freedom and support in shaping the programs and the events today. We are very proud to be associated with all of you, Madam, Sirs, thank you very much. We are very thankful to Professor Sitabara Sinha for comparing today's program. Finally, we convey our deep thanks to our colleagues Shri Jayaraj, Srimati Gayatri, Srimati Indira, Shri K.P. Shankaran, Shri Vasudevan, Shri Parthiban, Shri Srinivas Raghavan, Johnson, Prema, Srimati Vidya Lakshmi, Shri Ahmad, Mohan, Shri Arangarajan, Dr. Subramaniam, Shri Ravindra Reddy, Sundarlingam, Shivaraj, Shri Agilan, and many other colleagues in office in preparing invitations and their dispatch, booking of guest house accommodation, garden st staff keeping the campus green, catering staff for providing us a delicious food today, technical and uh, uh, technical staff for uh, stage settings and uh, lighting systems, administrative staff, security wing, housekeeping staff who worked and still working with diligence and full zeal in extending wholehearted support in making the Golden Jubilee events of this uh, institute a grand success. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sri Vishnu. We shall now break for refreshments for 20 minutes, and we'll reassemble here at 12.10 for Professor Krishna Swami Aladi's talk. Uh, this will be followed by lunch, which is arranged at the Institute. And let me also extend you a uh, welcome to uh, dinner, which has been arranged today at the Institute in the evening. So we shall now break for refreshments, and please be back here at 12.10. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Krishna Swami Aladi who is a well-known mathematician specializing in the area of number theory at the University of Florida in the United States. In addition to his research in mathematics, he has also written several popular articles on mathematics and mathematicians. He has been associated with the Institute of Mathematical Sciences right from its inception. 
His father, Professor Aladi Ramakrishnan, was the founder director of the institute, and he himself was on the faculty of the institute from 1981 to 1986. Today, we welcome him here to give us an overview of the initial years of the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. I now request Professor Bala Subramaniam to felicitate Professor Aladi Krishna Swami. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. May I now invite Professor Krishna Swami Aladi to deliver his talk. Respected members who spoke earlier during the inaugural ceremony, the director of Math Science, members of the Golden Jubilee Committee who kindly invited me to give this talk, uh, faculty, students and staff of the Math Science Institute and friends. It's a great honor for me to be present here during the Golden Jubilee celebrations of the Math Science Institute, an institute that I had the pleasure of having been a witness to its conception and evolution. Uh, I thought it would be most appropriate on an occasion such as this to talk about the theoretical physics seminar that my father the founder director of the institute conducted in our family home, Ekamra Nivas, formally as a theoretical physics seminar from 1959 to 61, but somewhat more informally actually before that because the students assembled in our house a few years prior to that. There are really several reasons for choosing this topic as far as I am concerned. First of all, the, as I said, the origin of math science can be traced back to the seminar. But secondly, I also feel, and this is no exaggeration, that this is really one of the most exciting sagas, not only in the history of science in India, but in the history of science as a whole. Because from what I will be describing, you will realize that almost from a vacuum, something wonderful was created and that seed that was sown between 1959 and 1961 has blossomed into this magnificent campus and institute who introduced my father to a problem, to probabilistic problems uh, in cosmic ray showers. So uh, my father has often said the greatest gift that a professor can give to a student is a good problem and that's what Baba gave him. But as it turned out, um, when Baba and my father were working on this problem together, they actually approached it in very different ways, which actually is good. I mean, they approached the problem in very different ways, and one particular aspect of the problem, they both solved, but by completely different approaches. Baba preferred to write a paper using his uh, somewhat longer and more, what appeared to be a more rigorous treatment at that time, so for whatever reasons, uh, my father decided to leave the Tata Institute and he went to the University of Manchester to do his PhD, where at that time, Professor M. S. Bartlett, a great statistician, was interested in similar studies. And there was also D.G. Kendall at Oxford. So upon arrival in Manchester, both Bartlett and Kendall realized that this method of product densities that my father had initiated was very important and communicated my father's work to the proceedings of the Cambridge Philosophical Society. And so my father's first paper on this particular topic appeared simultaneously and independently of Homi Baba who communicated his paper to the proceedings of the Royal Society. So it's interesting that they came at about the same time. Now after his PhD in Manchester, my father returned to Madras and joined the University of Madras as a reader in physics. And while he was in Madras, he developed the theory of product densities by himself and with his students. So I mentioned two students whose pictures you will soon see. Uh, one was uh, P.M. Matthews, Professor Matthews, who later went on to become the head of the theoretical physics department of the Madras University. He was my father's first student. And the other was 
S.K. Srinivasan, who later went on to become the head of the mathematics department at the IIT. So these were two students, and with them, he first started investigating a manifold applications of the uh, theory of product densities. It was also at this time, because of the initial work on cosmic ray showers, that my father became interested in a problem in cosmic radiation. And this problem was, of course, deeply studied by the great Subramanyam Chandra Sekhar. So thus started a major correspondence between my father and Subramanyam Chandra Sekhar, which resulted in several papers at that time written by my father and, and actually Professor Matthews and others being communicated to the Astrophysical Journal of which Subramanyam Chandra Sekhar was the chief editor. So this was all in the mid-1950s. Now, during this time, my father availed every possible opportunity to invite leading physicists to the University of Madras and also get them to our home. I just mentioned three names. One was Dirac, uh, the, one of the greatest physicists of the last century, and the other was uh, Powell. And then one of the visitors, a very eminent visitor, was uh, Mark Oliphant. But there were many other visitors, but I just mentioned these three who were very influential in his career. In 1956, my father had the opportunity to make a round the world trip, primarily first to go to a conference at the University of Rochester that Professor Robert Marshak was organizing. This is the famous Rochester conference, the high energy physics conferences. And he also wanted to utilize this trip to meet with many leading physicists of that day. My, over a period of 40 or 50 years, he has made many trips abroad, but I consider this 1956, his very first trip, to be actually the most significant among all his trips. And I'll just mention the reasons, and that has a direct bearing on the theoretical physics seminar. First of all, he spent two weeks at Yukawa Hall, the Institute of Physics that the Nobel laureate uh, Hedy Yukawa was, was, uh, was the director of. And in these two weeks, he noticed how Japan, after the major defeat in the World War, was have going through a resurrection in science, for example, in this case, under the able guidance of Hedy Yukawa, and he saw young physicists grappling with problems in modern physics. And he felt something like this should be brought back to Madras, or something like this must be started in Madras. Following Yukawa Hall, he visited the Rand Corporation in California, where he met Richard Bellman, and that was a, 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 a bond that was to uh, grow in strength uh, and sustenance over the next three or four decades. But the main point was when Bellman asked him what he wanted to do most in Los Angeles, my father said he wanted a meeting with Richard Feynman. And that meeting was one of the most significant for him because Richard Feynman personally gave him a one-hour lecture in his office on how the electron travels back in time. And in listening to Feynman, um, my father at that time said well, it was wonderful listening to him, but he was also convinced that there could be alternative ways of viewing this description of Feynman of the electron uh, moving back in time because of his background in uh, probability. I had mentioned about this contact with Subramaniam Chandra Sekhar. This work, one of the joint papers that my father wrote with P.M. Matthews was actually on an integral equation of Chandra Sekhar and Munch, where they obtained a significantly simplified solution to that same integral equation, which appeared, of course, this paper appeared in the Astrophysical Journal. So my father met Guido Munch, who took him to Mount Wilson Observatory. And so on moving further um, eastward, he went to Chicago, where he had his first meeting with Subramaniam Chandra Sekhar. And he was much impressed by the fact that Chandra Sekhar went all the way to give a class with only two students, who happened to be Yang and Lee, who, of course, a couple of years later won the Nobel Prize. So the entire class won the Nobel Prize, so to speak. Um, so he spent uh, discussing with Chandra Sekhar at University of Chicago and also went to Yerkes Observatory where Chandra Sekhar uh, did his stellar observations. The high energy physics conference in Rochester that was organized by Marshak had a spectacular effect on my father. This was the first time he was hearing such great advances in theoretical and elementary particle physics. So he had at that time the desire 
to actually change from the theory of probability and move into elementary particle physics. But you know, change is not easy. It has to, other events have to come to sort of help you with it. But the other interesting thing that happened at that conference was when he was sitting in a corner, and he chose to sit in a corner because he felt he was not really part of the mainstream physics that was being done. He's a probabilist and relatively unknown person. So he was sitting in the corner of the dining room of the uh, University of Rochester where the conference was being held by himself. So the great Robert Oppenheimer walked up to him and said, may I join you for lunch? So that was a chance meeting, providential chance meeting with Robert Oppenheimer that happened over lunch. And at that time when the two had a conversation, Oppenheimer asked him what he was doing and what he would like to do in the future. And immediately my father said, I'd like to visit the Institute for Advanced Study. And of course, Oppenheimer was the director of the Institute. So um, shortly thereafter, he did receive an invitation to go to the Institute. But then, after the Rochester Conference, coming back to India via Europe, he had the chance to give a colloquium in the seminar that uh, Werner Heisenberg had organized. In, in Göttingen, and Heisenberg was a person that my father had actually met in Manchester during one of the conferences, so that's how the correspondence with Heisenberg began. And the interesting thing about this particular uh, uh, meeting with Heisenberg was Heisenberg expressed great uh, admiration for certain aspects of my father's work, and in that seminar was uh, Professor Fluge, who had association with Springer Verlag, and he was very much impressed with Heisenberg's positive comments, so he invited my father to write a major article in the Handbook der Physik on probability. So that's how that actually came about. So this 1956 visit, I think this round the world trip, had much more influence on his career than any of his other trips. So I asked my dad once, and you've traveled so much, which do you think really is your most significant? And he told me it's the 1956 round the world tour. So, um, my father came back to Madras and started studying the works of Feynman and the, and the physicists. And during that time, in 19, towards the end of 1956, he got this invitation from Oppenheimer to visit the Institute for Advanced Study in 57, 58. So let me start first with uh, that slide here. I think you need, now you, can, you should switch off the... Uh, sorry, I need to go back one slide. Okay, all right. No, no, one, one more forward. Okay. So this is a picture of my father in front of the stately Fald Hall of the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, taken in 1957. And I have one more picture, in, and this is in front of his office building at the Institute for Advanced Study. By the way, quite coincidentally, in 1980-81, uh, yeah, when I visited the Institute for Advanced Study, my office was in this building as well. So that just happened to be a coincidence. Now, um, the visit to the Institute was really a dream come true. There he had the opportunity to listen to more than 100 lectures by the leading physicists of the day. That included Lee and Yang, Abraham Pius, Stromgren, uh, you name it. And everybody was there at the Institute. And this convinced him not only to bring back the Princeton seminar spirit to Madras, but also he said, now I'm ready to plunge into theoretical physics because I've heard all these seminars. So this was a fantastic uh, um, uh, benefit for him to be at the Institute. So he came back to Madras. So here's a picture of the University of Madras. The environs look much lovelier than today. That I can definitely say because I've recently had a walk along the beach. So these are just some pictures of the University of Madras at that time. But the problem that he faced was he was really very disappointed with the outdated syllabus of the Madras University. And he wanted to introduce advanced theoretical physics in the syllabus. The university was very resistant to this change. So he had to do something. And so what he decided upon his return from the institute was to say that he would actually start a series of lectures to the very talented students that had gathered not only for the MSc course, but who were willing to come regularly and attend these talks of my father at our home. So that is how the theoretical physics seminar formally was started. But here I have to say that it is not easy 
to keep inviting on a regular basis students and visitors to your house unless you have the total cooperation and support of your wife. Okay. <laughs> and so my mother, Mrs. Lalita Ramakrishnan, who had accompanied my father to Princeton and to Manchester on many of these trips, realized the importance of actually supporting my father on this venture. And so lavish dinners were given at our, at our home for the visitors and of course the students were all part of this, uh, of this experience. And I mention also my wife, uh, uh, about the support of my wife because inspired by these, I give parties and host my visitors at the University of Florida very well and I couldn't do that without Mathura's support. Um, so anyway, uh, the next thing that I want to do is to show you a couple of slides of, so this is Ekamra Nivas as it looked in those days. Uh, the home of my grandfather, Saraladi Krishna Swami Iyer. And in the upstairs of Ekambar Nivas is a magnificent uh, lecture hall over there. And, uh, or the big hall, which my father used as a lecture hall. And you will see some more pictures of that uh, lecture hall. So visitors used to come regularly. Here's just a, a picture with a visitor. And not only that, he made sure that they were, ex they were treated very well. So these, this is an example of a dinner at Ekambra Nivas. The two students that you actually see here at the dinner, that is uh, Anantana Rayanan and that is Indumati. Uh, and he also made sure that whenever visitors came, his students would interact closely with the visitors. He had a very high opinion of uh, Balachandran. And so here is an example where he actually uh, made Balachandran talk to this visitor uh, at some length. Now, it turned out that at that time, the University of Madras was interested in starting an extension center at Madurai, in Madurai. So my father was asked to go and start the physics department at this extension center. So he writes in his diary, and I'm going to just read straight away from his uh, from his diary, he said, what really pained me was that the university took no cognizance of the valuable experience I gained at Princeton. I had heard over 150 seminars by world famous physicists and I wanted to initiate work in high energy physics in a university which had among its alumni Ramanujan, Raman and Chandrasekhar. The only reward for my enthusiasm was the modest compliment of banishing me as a professor to an extension center. So he was sent away to Madurai and he served there for about a year and a half. Um, but interestingly, what happened was he got appointed to a Hindi commission where you had to put scientific terms in Hindi. Now, my father was no expert in Hindi, okay, but he was some sort of an expert on scientific terms. So he accepted the assignment on this Hindi commission because it gave him an opportunity to leave Madurai and travel Maya Madras to Delhi. So that was the main reason he accepted this assignment. But what he did while he was in Madurai, when he, where he took some of his students, was he continued to communicate with the international community of scientists. So you must understand these were days when it was no, there was no email. So all communication was by letters and so there is a time of transit and time for reply. But in spite of this, he was able to somehow find out who was coming to Bombay, who was coming to Calcutta, to the Indian Statistical Institute, or who was passing through Delhi, or who was in a conference somewhere in Hong Kong. And he would invite these people to come and lecture regularly at our seminar, at a seminar in Madras. And this has to be done judiciously during the time frame when he would be passing from Madurai to Delhi via Madras or make a special trip to Madras. So I want you to understand the difficulty of doing this. This is not really very easy. So this actually tells you the passion that he had to, to conduct these uh, seminars. Now, um, it's one thing to conduct seminars at home, but you really need to get the attention of a top level administrator to recognize that what you're doing is of value. So it turned out that um, one day, my father was invited to a meeting at the Woodlands Hotel of the African Students Association. And I think maybe it was African and East Asian Students Association, at which Mr. C. Subramaniam was speaking. And he was invited to attend this meeting. 
My father had known that Mr. C. Subramaniam in his younger days had visited my grandfather in Delhi when my grandfather was drafting the Indian constitution, but he really had no specific contact with Subramaniam. So he felt there is no need to go to this meeting because these politicians, they are not going to be interested in fundamental science like this and this is also a meeting of some student group and so there will be really no opportunity to talk to him about fundamental science. So my father and mother were on their way to the Madras beach for their evening walk, but my mother said, regardless of whether you think Mr. C. Subramaniam is going to take positively towards science or not, you should still have the courtesy to respond to a good invitation that has been sent to you. So let us just stop at the Madras woodlands for a few minutes on our way to the beach. So at her insistence, they went to the Madras, uh, to the Madras woodlands and attended this seminar. There some questions were asked. I won't get into these questions because I may be treading into areas which are politically incorrect. But anyway, some questions were asked and Mr. Subramaniam gave an answer and my father also gave an answer to one of these questions. My father, Subramaniam, was very much impressed with my father's answer and said that he would actually like to, you know, get to know him better and knew, he knew him as the son of Saraladi Krishna Swami Ayur. So my father said, why don't you please come to my house and meet the students of the theoretical physics seminar and I will tell you what exactly is happening. So this is Subramaniam at our house with the students of the theoretical physics seminar and some others also. That is G. Ramachandran and I understand that Professor Murthy, who is very much involved in this 50th anniversary celebration, this is a former student of uh, G. Ramachandran. And that is actually my uh, distinguished uncle, Dr. P. Hariharan, who won major awards in optics, in holography. So anyway, so he came and spent a relaxed evening at our home, meeting the students of the theoretical physics seminar. And at the end, Mr. Subramaniam asked my father what exactly he wanted. And my father said we should create something like the Institute for Advanced Study uh, here in Madras. So this was what happened during that time. So, um, but of course this, this has to be realized later. So I see here some other students. There were at that time four girls, four students of my father. So that's TK Radha, that is uh, um, Tunga, and that is Bhamati, and that is Indumati and we'll have more pictures of them a little bit later. Um, so anyway, so this was a, a, a very healthy visit of uh, C. Subramaniam to our house. Now, when, when visitors came, there were not just talks at Ekamra Nivas. My father also made sure that they went around Madras to see some of the sites of, of that the city had to offer and some sites around it. So here is Devanadan with A.M. Lane at a temple. I forget what temple this is. I have some more pictures. Here is him at Mahabalipuram. Okay. So considerable amount of time was spent with these visitors and making sure that they really enjoyed the visit to Madras. This is Professor Yano C. at the Madras beach. And there is S.K. Srinivasan. So uh, while in England, uh, there were major discussions between my father and Professor Yano C. on problems relating to stochastic processes and S.K. Srinivasan was the student who was most into stochastic processes among all the members of the theoretical physics seminar. Okay, so now moving along. Um, so there were, in addition to his own lectures, there were lectures by visitors and the students uh, took part in active discussions with all these visitors. I'm going to highlight two visits that came about immediately, almost immediately after Subramaniam's visit to our home in 1959. One was the visit of Abdus Salam. And he was in India in connection with, I think, the Indian Science Congress. And my father had heard very much about him and invited him to be a guest at Ekamra Nivas and meet the students. So Salam gave a two hour lecture and so this is the lecture that he is giving to the students. By the way, this, this blackboard is now in my office room in Madras. So my father presented it to me later when I decided to take to an academic career. Um, anyway, so um, Salam spent a relaxed after, uh, day in, in, uh, at Ekamra Nivas discussing with students. That, by the way, is Professor Venkataraman, a Gandhian, both in appearance and in his personal habits. Uh, and he was the one who started the mathematics department at Madurai University when my father was starting the physics department. 
So, uh, Abdul Salam was uh, at Eka Manivas. You see some more of the students here. Um, and one of the things I want to mention about Salam was Salam actually at that time had his own vision of creating an institute for advanced learning in Pakistan. Okay, so this is 1960. It turned out that in 1960, after the 1956 tour, my father made a visit to Europe, visiting Niels Bohr, visiting Andre Mercier, and a few others. And during that 1960 visit, there was a small, I wouldn't call it a conference, a small meeting that Salam arranged as the Castello Miramar, which is very close to the current uh, premises of the International Center for Theoretical Physics. And in that Castle Miramar, this group of scientists were told by Salam that he had a vision to start an institute for advanced learning, but since he could not try to get it in Pakistan, he probably would like to locate it somewhere in Europe. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Indira Chaudhary had made a reference to this letter from Mrs. Indira Gandhi to my father, uh, a letter that I had actually given her, and in which Mrs. Gandhi says that she was not very pleased with some of Salam's views, but the details were not mentioned there. And so Dr. Chaudhary was speculating what it could be. I'm not offering a solution, but I'm going to state a fact, and I leave it to you to interpret what Salam might have told Mrs. Gandhi. So after this meeting, at the Castle Miramar in 1960, a proposal was sent by Abdul Salam to several representatives of the so-called developing countries. And so India also received this proposal from Salam. And in response, it is known that the Indian representative was not in favor of Salam starting such an international center in Europe. And the statement that was made was, it will be detrimental to the development of science in India. So that's there in that letter. So I can only speculate, perhaps Salam had mentioned this to, I don't know, he might have mentioned this to Mrs. Gandhi, and maybe some discussion took place. But nonetheless, there was, it was not a favorable response from India at that time. But of course, now the links between India and the International Center for Theoretical Physics are very strong, and we have lots of very eminent scientists from our country who go regularly to the International Center for Theoretical Physics. So I only mention this as a fact. This is not my, uh, I mean, it's not a theorem or anything. I'm just saying that this, this thing actually happened. Whether that was the actual conversation between Salam and Gandhi, uh, Mrs. Gandhi is to be speculated. Immediately following Salam's visit to Madras was the visit of Niels Bohr. Bohr was visiting India as the guest of uh, Prime Minister Nehru, and he was traveling around the country, and my father invited him to the seminar and to meet the students and uh, talk to them about physics. So when so Niels Bohr graciously accepted this, okay, and so that's just a picture of me with my father. I was with him all the time. Um, so here is uh, a dinner at Ekam Ranivas for Niels Bohr. The, since he was the guest of Prime Minister Nehru, he was, a comp he was staying at the Raj Bhavan, okay, and one of the uh, persons, aide de camp, was with him constantly. Now, the thing was, this person was getting nervous that Niels Bohr was overstaying with us in a company was. Maybe the allotted time was one hour, and it was going well past two hours, and it was getting into the wee hours of, of the night as far as Madras is concerned. Anything beyond 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. is considered very late. Okay, ours is a very traditional city, at least in the 1960s it was. So the, this representative, this AD camp was getting very nervous, but uh, Niels Bohr said, no, no, I want to continue to be here and have discussions with the students. But here is a dinner at um, Ekamra Nivas, a uh, South Indian style dinner, and there you actually you see uh, food served on a plantain leaf, and that's uh, P.M. Matthews along with uh, my father and Niels Bohr. Um, so my, here's my mother in discussion with Mrs. Bohr. And this, of course, is the picture that you see uh, in the wall motif that has now been created. So in this um, discussion, one thing became clear that for Niels Bohr, there were not too many places where he met people with whom he could engage in meaningful discussions on problems in modern physics. But here was a small group of students in Madras who could actually ask him good questions, and he could have a meaningful discussion. So when Bohr went back to New Delhi, there was a press conference. And at this press conference, the question was asked, what impressed him most um, 
in his visit to India. And Bohr said there were two things that impressed him the most. One was the massive setup of the Tata Institute headed by Homi Baba. And the other was the small group of students trained by Aladdin Ramakrishnan in Madras. So there was a big difference in terms of scale. But he said these were the two things that impressed him the most. This was immediately flashed in the papers. And naturally, it attracted the attention of the Prime Minister. He was the Prime Minister's guest. So the Prime Minister expressed interest in meeting Aladi Ramakrishnan and his students, possibly you know, in the near future when he came to Madras. But it was not clear when he was going to come to Madras the next time. So here is where the role of Mr. C. Subramanian becomes very important. So here is another seminar. All right. So this is all 1960. So 1960, January, was the visit of Niels Bohr. The institute did not really begin until January of 1962. So something must be going on in those two years. So a prime minister is impressed with, some, with this, but that doesn't necessarily mean everything takes place right away. So my father, meanwhile, was repeatedly writing to C. Subramaniam, exhorting him to uh, convince, at that time, the Madras government to start this institute. But once this comment came, he also was making a great effort with C. Subramaniam to attract the attention of, uh, of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. But you see, it's not easy to just go and talk to a, a prime minister and say, you know, here is this young person in, in Madras, and I think we have to pay serious attention to what he has to say. You have to get the concurrence of the scientific community. So what actually happened was that Mr. Subramaniam went on a trip to the United States in 1961. And my father said, why don't you meet Chandra Sekhar there? Why don't you meet Dick Bellman? Why don't you meet a few others? And they will be able to give you a fair and impartial assessment of the work that we are doing and why there is a need for something like this. And so Subramaniam seriously took this suggestion and during his trip to the United States, went out of the way to meet Bellman at Rand, meet Chandra Sekhar and others. So, so when he came back, he said, I am convinced that you are doing fundamental work here, but we have to wait for the opportune time to launch this institute. But nonetheless, he, 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 he did make these visits and came back with a very positive opinion. Around about that time, in the middle of 1961, in the summer of 1961, there was a major conference that the Tata Institute was organizing, one of their summer schools. And the two main lecturers at that summer school were Murray Gelman and Dalit. So there you see Homi Baba. Well, Gelman and Dalits. So I'm going to show you pictures of, of Gelman and Dalits. And so this is actually taken in Nandi Hills during an excursion. And here are, uh, so my father took his four uh, uh, female students to that uh, conference. So here we are at uh, Krishna Raja Sagar. Okay. Uh, and at that conference, my father said, would you like to come and spend a few days in Madras at our home? And you actually can meet the entire group of students. So Gelman and Dalits agreed to come to Ekambanivas. By the way, I must say, the pictures, most of the pictures taken of my mother are very good. The pictures taken of my father were taken sometimes by me as a young boy. So there's a little bit of a shake there. So I now feel very guilty that, that uh, this valuable picture I could not take properly. Now, of course, I'm a seasoned photographer and my family accuses me by saying that every time we travel, I see the world only through a lens. But uh, anyway, I wish I had seen the world through a lens at that time. All right, so this is Gelman and Dalits at our house. And the effect of the visit of both Gelman and Dalits was unbelievable. Okay, my father was completely taken in, not only by Gelman's, the, the fundamental nature of Gelman's work, but by his charisma, by the manner in which he gave his, uh, his lectures. And he used to tell me that when you give talks, it should not just be an ordinary talk. You have to hold the audience spellbound. And of course, my father himself was uh, almost like an orator. But anyway, he, he fell in love with Gelman's uh, style of lecturing and his charisma. Uh, Dalits had given a series of talks. And I think one of the things that happened was that A.P. Balachandran went to, uh, on a postdoctoral fellowship with Dalits soon after he completed his PhD under my father. So, my father has a list of uh, a list here where not only does he say these are the PhD students, but the kind of postdoctoral fellowships that many of them got after they completed the, their degree. And this was all a consequence of the, either the visits of these people to Madras or my father's uh, visits to their um, uh, the place, uh, their universities in the U.S. or Europe. I do want to mention uh, put put this picture of uh, Nambi Iyengar. 
um, we had a very loyal and affectionate personal assistant. He actually lived in our house. And he would type letters at any time of the day or night. And when the Mad Science Institute was, was launched, and the news came that the institute was going to be launched, in one day, he typed more than, physically typed more than 75 letters. It's not like you just take Xerox copies, dear sir, and you keep signing. He actually physically typed more than 75 letters one night and sent them off by the Madras mail that used to stand outside the Mailapur club near my house. As I said, this was all before the days of email. So this was a loyal secretary who later was at Math Science. Now, um, in addition to, to uh, having guests at our house, my father also felt it was very important to take part in conferences um, in India. So this is a picture at the Masuri Summer School with Devanadan and, and uh, Venkateshan. He actually says in his diary at that time that Satyendranath Bose was the person who was organizing the Masuri Summer School. But he says that some members, and I won't mention names, of certain leading institutions did not attend the Masuri summer school because they did not believe in the philosophy of that summer school. So Satyendranath Bose apparently said it's very important to give a number of short talks by different participants on their current research rather than long expository talks by, you know, senior people. So that was his belief. And so he came back and he said to his students, our, the Masuri spirit must dominate our country, that we must really encourage people to give, even if it's a short talk, we must encourage different people to give talks rather than just have the same group of senior people dominate the show at every conference. So that's why I'm mentioning this Masuri Summer School. Um, so there is Devanadan, who was actually the secretary of the theoretical physics seminar. And this is G. Ramachandran, who also went to the Masuri Summer School. All right, so after the visit of Gelman and Dalitz, there was a visit of another Nobel laureate, Donald Glazer, who got the Nobel Prize for the bubble chamber. And um, he actually um, spent not only time giving lectures, but engaged in discussion with students. So my father always made students give talks here to these Nobel laureates. So there's Devanadan. The previous slide was A.P. Balachandran. And uh, there you see Professor Devanadan intently taking notes. Okay, so this is all the visit of Don Glazer. And um, so that's the entire group of theoretical physics seminar students. Let me mention a few names. There is Desh Pandey. Uh, there you see Balachandar, Tunga, Radha. There is Umarji. And uh, that is Raman. Uh, there is Indumati and Vamati. And of course, Chiramchandar Nabhengar was there. Uh, that's Mrs. Glazer. And the Glazers were also taken on an excursion uh, around Madras. Right, now in addition to physicists, mathematicians visited regularly also. So this is Marshall Stone, who at that time was visiting India regularly because he was on a committee for the improvement of mathematics education in India. Now Marshall Stone was the son of a Supreme Court justice. So he could appreciate, and, and he built the mathematics department at the University of Chicago and made it really an outstanding department. So the period when Marshall Stone was chairman at Chicago is often referred to as the Stone Age. Okay, so it's age of Marshall Stone, not Stone Age of the, you know, pre bullockart era. So uh, Marshall Stone could appreciate my father's efforts for two reasons. He himself built up this major department, so he knew that my father was trying to do something here. But also, he was the son of a Supreme Court judge, so he could also understand the background of my father, whose father was a well-known jurist in, in India. So this is Marshall Stone at Madras Airport. Actually, Marshall Stone visited India regularly, and he used to attend the Madras Music Academy uh, sessions with my parents. And in fact, one day at the Madras Woodlands Hotel, he passed away after attending a concert at the Madras Music Academy. So he actually uh, died in Madras in 1987, January, I think. So this is Andre Mercier from Switzerland, who was a visitor and who invited my father on this 1960 trip to, to Switzerland. Now, very important is the visit of uh, Dr. Maurice Shapiro, uh, who was at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington. Now, Shapiro, was not a scientist in the class of Gelman or, 
or Abdul Salam, he was, but he was a very well known and solid researcher in cosmic rays. But his visit was extremely important. He was very much impressed with what was happening at the theoretical physics seminar that he said he wanted to meet C. Subramanian. So a meeting was arranged between uh, Maurice Shapiro and C. Subramanian. And Shapiro had actually worked on the, uh, in the Manhattan Project under Robert Oppenheimer in Los Alamos. So he made a statement to C. Subramanian that watching the students, uh, this was an actual statement he made, watching the students gather around Aladdin Ramakrishnan reminded him in the manner in which students gathered around Oppenheimer in Los Alamos. And he said, therefore, you really should take this proposal of Haladi Ramakrishnan seriously. So that was actually extremely important. So this was happening towards the end of 1961. Okay. This is Makriya Haslett, provost of the University of Rochester at our home for dinner. And um, this is Sir James Lighthill of, at that time, the Royal Aircraft Establishment in Farnborough. Later, Lighthill occupied Newton's chair in Cambridge, at Cambridge University. So Lytle was a contact of my father going back to the days at Manchester. Now, so this was now the end of 1961. So we are now coming to almost close to the end of the theoretical physics seminar. I suppose I can talk until 10 past. Is that okay? Since I started 10 past. Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I'll finish very soon. Okay, so um, Subramaniam Chandra Sekar was visiting Madras. And as I said, my father had met him in Chicago, so he naturally asked him to come to Ekamanivas and give lectures. And then he said, you should come to, uh, to Ekamanivas and give So Subramaniam Chandra Sekar humorously said, I will do that on one condition, that you give me a South Indian style sit-down plantain leaf dinner, which was, of course, the, the thing that we normally do. But so that was just a, a simple request from Chandra Sekar. So here he is in the Kudam area of Ekamanivas, and there you see the students, Balachandra Srinivas and Devanathan, um, uh, and others. So, as is customary, the ladies sat on the other side. So, some Chandra Sekar spent a leisurely afternoon, uh, evening at Ekamranivas. Now, with the um, statement made by um, Maurice Shapiro, Subramaniam went to Delhi and presented the proposal of my father that an institute be started. Okay. Now, he was actually very instrumental in convincing Jawaharlal Nehru that the institute must be started in Madras. So I'm going to read now a passage from, Subraman, uh, from Subramaniam's autobiography called The Hand of Destiny, in which there is a full chapter called Mathematics, and the chapter is mostly devoted to the creation of math science and how he played a role in the creation of math science. So just one short paragraph, which I'm actually going to read directly. So, so this, I'm quoting Subramaniam. Ramakrishnan mentioned to me that for the purpose of encouraging young talent in theoretical physics and mathematics, a new institute was necessary. At that time, the primary research work in mathematics and theoretical physics was being done at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay under the auspices of the Atomic Energy Commission, headed by, also headed by Homi Baba. Ramakrishnan emphasized the need for another institute so that there might be some healthy competition. But another institute could only be started with the concurrence of the Atomic Energy Commission and the Government of India. Jawaharlal Ji was greatly impressed by the enthusiasm shown by the students of Professor Ramakrishnan. When they told him, now this is what the students told him, when they told Nehru that they needed an institution for the development of theoretical physics and mathematics, he asked me, that is Subramaniam, to examine the proposal of Ramakrishnan and put up a note for his consideration. Ramakrishnan prepared such a note and I sent it to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister referred the matter to Dr. Homi Baba for his advice. Unfortunately, Dr. Baba was not very enthusiastic. His contention was that the available limited resources would have to be utilized for the existing institution, namely the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. When the Prime Minister passed this opinion of Dr. Baba to me, I requested him to arrange a meeting between me, Dr. Baba, and himself to discuss this matter. The meeting was arranged and I argued my case for a separate institution in the South, 
particularly when talented students in the South were not getting opportunities for pursuing their interests because of the limited number of students admitted to the Tata Institute. I also emphasize that mathematical sciences did not require a heavy investment. Panditji showed his inclination to accept my point of view. So Dr. Baba also gave his consent. Thereafter, steps were taken to establish what is now well known as the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. For the purpose of emphasizing the importance of this institute and for its proper funding, I thought we should have Jawaharlal Nehru himself as the patron of the institute. When I mentioned this to him, he gladly agreed. I requested Dr. Baba to, the, to be a member of the first governing body, and he too graciously agreed. So in the end, everything came out nicely, but really we owe to Mr. C. Subramaniam for making a strong case for the creation of the Math Science Institute. So when Subramaniam came back, um, I think it was uh, end of November, he said that on December 8th, the Prime Minister is coming to Madras and has agreed to meet the students at uh, dinner, following a dinner at the Raj Bhavan. So here is a meeting of Jawaharlal Nehru with C. Subramaniam here, my father in a Nehru jacket, and all the students, so there you see Devanathan, Umarji, Venkateshan, Raman, Balachandran, Anantan, Arayanan, and Bhamati, and there are other students here. Here is Radha, I think. So anyway, so this was a, a great meeting, and at the end of the meeting, um, the Prime Minister asked my father, what is it that you want? What is it that you are really asking? Or, And so my father has told me, you may not get this opportunity, but if a really important person asks you what you want, don't ask for something simple, ask for something big. So I have played this game a little bit with deans and provosts at the University of Florida with some success. I have not created a new institute, but I've got some extra funding for the math department. But anyway, uh, so my father said, we really need a new institute for advanced study. And the next question for Nero was, from Nero was, do you really mean that you want another institute? And then the answer was, yes, we need another institute. So that's when this whole proposal went to Nero and C. Subramaniam played this, uh, this role. So that's once again the University of Madras at that time. Now, things happened very rapidly. So this was December 8th, the meeting with uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. On December 22nd, Ramanujan's birthday, my father got the appointment order to be the director of the new institute. So what a coincidence that it actually happened on Ramanujan's birthday. And I am, of course, a big votary of Ramanujan, and I've taken part in all these 125 celebrations. So the 50th anniversary of math science, to me, coincides with the 125th birth anniversary of Srinivasa Ramanujan. So 2012 is a significant year in many ways. But now the thing was to get an appropriate person to inaugurate the institute. And my father felt very strongly that it has to be done by an Indian or a person of Indian origin. And he said, let Subramaniam Chandrasekhar be invited to give the, uh, do the inauguration of the institute. And he was actually in Madras. And so Chandra agreed very graciously and said on one condition, you have to somehow make sure that my departure from Madras is postponed and you get the air reservations suitably. So those were days when these things could be done quite naturally because most people paid full fares so and not these excursion fares with penalties. So my father arranged for that. So here is Subramaniam Chandra Sekar and my father and um, uh, Mr. Subramaniam walking to the dais at the uh, Presidency College. Uh, so this is the old English lecture hall of the Presidency College as it looked in those days. After my father passed away in 2008, uh, very gr uh, graciously actually, the Presidency College invited me to have a memorial function for him. And I presented a portrait of my father to the Presidency College. And that is being, I understand, being hung alongside Chandrasekhar and Raman who are alumni of the college. But I must say, I was very sad to see the state of the Presidency College where they said that they had no funds at all from uh, either the government or the university for the upkeep of their grounds. So while on one sense it was a nostalgic visit, I was also saddened to see the, the state of the old English lecture hall. So my father wanted this inauguration to take place in the old English lecture hall because he had himself taken classes there. And so he wanted this very much and was very pleased that the inauguration took place at the English Lecture Hall. I must say that this speech of my father, the miracle has happened that he gave, is one of the most inspiring speeches that he ever gave in his life. And during that memorial service, uh, Justice Mohan, who had come, said, I had given him a copy of that speech. He said he read that speech and he said, this is so well written 
he really would like to have it as a sample of English prose given to students. I mean, it's, it was really fantastic. And the thing is, he gave the speech extempore. He did not have it prepared and given. He really gave the speech uh, extempore. He was inspired and um, he delivered this, uh, this uh, speech. So that is Subramanyam responding. And there is Chandrasekhar giving his talk. And shortly after that, the very first talk of the institute was by Subramanyam Chandrasekhar on gravitation. And this also took place in one of the lecture halls of the Presidency College. So in the early days, the institute was housed in the Presidency College and then moved on to the Central Polytechnic before uh, in the, one of the upper floors of the Central Polytechnic. And I think in 1969, it moved to its present premises here, which of course now have uh, grown considerably. Um, so here is a section of the audience um, uh, at the uh, inauguration. So I just conclude here with just two photographs. I cherish this photograph very much. Here is a picture of my father with Niels Bohr taken at Bohr's residence in Copenhagen in 1960. So this was after Bohr's visit to Madras. I just want to say one thing though. The scorachrome slides, they are really very good. Okay, but in the heat of Madras, sometimes fungus can appear. But fortunately for me, the fungus did not appear in any essential part to mar the photograph. So I was still able to get an enlargement and keep it as it is. So I actually took it to Kodak and asked them, is there a way that you can actually remove that? And they said, no, sir, we can't really touch Kodachrome. You're, you must be thankful that it's only that part that got a blemish, but nowhere else. So this is a picture taken in Nails Bohr's residence. And I think this is one of the finest pictures of my dad. This is actually taken in Switzerland during his uh, visit in 19, uh, 1960. So um, I just wanted to give you a, an, an impression, a flavor of what really went into this, the creation of this institute. Now, many things have happened since then. Many positive things have happened. There have been occasions when, you know, some difficulties have been experienced. But I think on an occasion like this, rather than dwell on negatives that have hap that happens in any institution. I was chairman of the University of Florida for 10 years, and I dealt with faculty members who were not productive. But uh, I don't want to talk about that. Okay? I want to talk about John Thompson, who got the Abel Prize when I was chairman, and not talk about somebody who said I don't want to write any papers. So I think on an occasion like this, we should be proud that the Institute has done so well and that it has weathered the storms. The storms are there, but it has weathered the storms. Uh, as I said, you sow the seed and as it grows up, there are several obstacles. But in spite of that, if it has become a tree, that is really what we should be happy about. So I'm, I'm personally very pleased to have uh, come here during the 50th anniversary celebrations and to take part in this uh, glorious event when we can reflect with pride as to how the institute started and every member of this institute has really contributed to the magnificent development of this organization. Thank you very much.